Good morning and welcome to this live webinar. Two weeks ago, we presented the basics of our first call for project proposals to more than 1,100 people in our launch event on this platform. Since then, we have published a number of additional tools and tutorials to provide you with more information on the call and to guide you through the application process. However, we understand that this process can be challenging and that there is never enough support. More than 100 questions were already posted at the launch event and addressed to our help desk. And over 600 people have registered to this Q&A webinar and asked their questions already in advance. Today, we will therefore fully focus on you. This time, we will not talk about what we deem important. We will not present anything new, but only listen to you. We want to hear your questions and your needs. What is unclear in our call documents and where do you need additional support? So let's start right away. I'm Frank Schneider and Head of Communications at the Interact Central Europe program. I will guide you through the next 90 minutes and four different Q&A rounds. In each of these rounds, your questions will be answered by different experts from the Joint Secretary. Let's take a quick look at what these four sessions are. In the first round of today's webinar, we will answer your questions on the general framework of the new program and the first call. In the second round, we will look into your questions on thematic scope and relevance of project proposals before in the third round, we will address your questions on project work plan development. And last but not least, in a fourth round, we will try to answer all your questions on project budget development and state aid. Maybe one important thing to mention before we really start. We are recording this webinar and we will upload it to our YouTube playlist tomorrow. This way you can revisit the answers to your questions whenever you want to. You already sent in quite a number of questions, more than 80 when I checked last, in advance before the webinar even started. But there's of course the option to post questions also live in the next 90 minutes. You can simply do so in the integrated slider tool on the right side of your screen. When you post a question, please keep it short and clear. Ideally, you also label your question for a specific session already. And if you want to, you can also upvote questions of others. Last but not least, let me point out that we will unfortunately not be able to answer all your questions in the coming 90 minutes. We already received more questions in advance then we have time to answer. So if your question will not have been addressed at the end of this webinar, please do not despair. Just send it per email to helpdesk at interreg-central.eu and we will get back to you individually. Or if it is a really specific question you might want to discuss with my colleagues, and there are already quite some of these questions sent in advance, you might want to discuss this question not with the help desk, but rather in an individual consultation, which we offer since Monday on this community platform. So before we now start with the first round of your questions, I would have a few questions for you on Slido to find out how prepared you are for today's webinar. Let's start, let's have a first look. So the first question is, have you already read all the key documents for the first call? The floor is yours. So 40, 50 people have answered 60. Nearly 100 now. Nearly 200 now. Okay, the picture is not changing that much anymore. Keep on voting, keep it, keep the answers coming in. I can see that 70, nearly 75% have read some of the documents, 20%, all of them. That's quite an achievement, I have to say, because there's a lot to read. And 7%, 8% have read none of them. So let's see if this is also going to be reflected in the next poll that I have for you. In a second question, I would like to find out 
after reading the documents maybe, what is so far your biggest challenge when developing a project proposal? Just type in a word, a phrase, a short sentence. Partnerships, budget, budget is quite big. Outputs, I see time. A lot of different topics because if you were all writing similar things, then one would be growing a lot. But spin off from university, international cooperation results, I see state aid, partner search, bureaucracy. Sustainability, nearly 200 people have put some keywords already. <laughs> Someone thinks he or she is the biggest problem in project development. I hope not so. Good partnership. All right, we have nearly 200 answers. Um, very different problems we can see. I think we can also see this from the questions that you uh, submitted already, especially on budget and on work plan development. Uh, we received many questions, also some more general questions. Um, we actually received so many questions that I would have a third poll for you. We just decided a few minutes ago that we will address this at you. So let's uh, see what your time uh, budget is for today's webinar, because with that many questions, we will not be able to answer even half of the ones that we received in advance. I would be very interested in a brief information from your end. Would you be ready to extend this 90 minute web webinar and turn it maybe into a 105 minutes or even a 120 minutes webinar? Let's see. Just uh, let me know what the majority says. Uh, are you fine with uh, prolonging the time you spend with us today a little bit so that we can cover more questions? Or would you rather prefer to finish by 11.30 and go into lunch soon? Okay, that is quite impressive. You want to spend some more time with us. I guess you will have to in the coming weeks and months if you're implying with us. So why not today? 90% of 250 people are saying, yes, we want to stay longer. The other 10%, maybe, I don't want to force you obviously to stay with us. Um, as you heard, we are recording this webinar. So you can re-watch the answers that are coming later at any point in time when the webinar has been uploaded. So for now, without much further ado, I would like to start looking into the first round of our question and answer webinar. In this first round, we will look into the general framework of the new program and the first call. The expert who will be joining me in this session is Luca Ferrarese, our head of joint secretariat. Let's have a look at a first question for this session. Again, we receive plenty of questions. Let's start with a rather general and easy one maybe. Can one organization apply as lead applicant for proposals in all four priorities in the same call? Luca, may I ask you to join me? And in the meantime, we have another poll for you. Hello, Luca. Hi, so, nice to see you. Hi. hi. So, before I will ask you to answer this question, I think you can still take a sip of coffee if you want to, because I would like to ask our participants, what is your opinion? What do you think is the right answer here? Can one organization apply as lead applicant for proposals in all four priorities or not? So the floor is yours. We have, uh, now you're a bit shyer out there, not answering as quickly as before. I understand that there 
is the need to think about it first. 150 answers, but there's a clear tendency. Look how people think that, of course, you can apply in all four priorities in the same call. Are they right? Uh, they are absolutely right. This is true. An applicant can submit a proposal in all four priorities as a lead applicant. The issue is just, do you manage? Do you have the capacity to be involved contemporarily in more priorities? And on the other hand, you need also to be a little bit focused on, on what is the mission of your organization. So, but still in theory it's possible. Thank you, Luca. Okay, then let's have a look into the next question. Sorry, I'm just facing a group. Okay. Okay. Sorry for this. Uh, I just needed to check my Slido view. So, Luca, what if our project attempts to have more than twelve partners? In the time of reference for the call, we give some recommendations. We give, uh, let's say, an indication what we do expect from projects to be selected from the first call. However, this is not a must. And if you have smaller or bigger partnerships, like in this case, this can be, it has just to be uh, uh, coherent with the approach and the content of the application form. So this is not a problem if the project has 12, more than 12 partners, but still it has to be well justified in, and it has to be clear why this is needed. Thank you, Luca. We have another question. How much research should be contained in the projects, in particular for those answering objectives in priority two? We put this into the general one. We move this up now because I don't think it's just a question relevant for priority two, Luca. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, I think we have to make very clear that our program is not funding research, pure research projects. We have in Europe much better instruments for that that are fit for research, like Horizon Pro, the Horizon program from the Commission. What we fund is regional development through cooperation, through transnational cooperation, in which, of course, there can be a research part, but the research should not be the aim, it should be the tool towards regional development. Thank you, Luca. Now, the next question is an interesting one because I've seen quite some interest in this topic. There were quite a number of questions going into this direction. And it is, could a partner from the program area implement activities in the countries outside of the EU? Well, <clears throat> as we also mentioned in the manual, there has to be, let's say, the Central Europe project should focus on the Central Europe area. So whatever is done by a project, it should be for the benefit of the Central Europe area. Of course, if this is well justified, a partner can implement activities also outside the program area and meaning also outside the European Union. But again, the requirements that we set in the, in the, in the manual, in which, according to which the, the benefit has to be clear and evident, and this, this has to be duly justified in the application form remains. So the answer is yes, but it has to be justified. It has to be for the good of the Central Europe. All right, thank you. The next question then is from a research organization. My research organization is based nationwide, so there is no specific regional level for geographical eligibility. I'm based in Rome. Can I still apply for the call or shall I be associated to a research unit located in the Italian eligible areas? Well, this is, a, let's say, already a rather specific question. And the, the good luck is that I'm Italian, so I know what <laughs> this person is talking about. So let's put in this way, keeping it in a general level, uh, we have, a, let's say, a specificity for what we call associated, as assimilated partners, sorry. Assimilated partners are those partners which are in Italy or in Germany 
that are in, in these countries, but they are outside the regions which are the Central European regions. So in this case, if they are public bodies and if they have a scope of action in, in, the, in the Central Europe regions of that country, they can be assimilated partners and they can be seen as, uh, uh, as a standard partner based in the, in the uh, Central Europe area. So they don't need to be associated to somebody else. They can be directly part of the project. Okay, the next one, anonymous. I mean, most of the questions you sent in in advance uh, were anonymous. I think if you ask a question now live and we are pushing it up, you will, we will also see your name. So in this case, Luca, another anonymous question, not because the person is probably afraid of asking it, but just because it was sent in advance. It is about the partner declaration. In the partner declaration, the form asks for the project ID number. Since the JAMS system will not be online until February, where I assume ID numbers will be issued, could we update the declaration form to not include the project ID, keeping the project name only to start collecting project partner forms already now? Well, um, let's say, first of all, in no case it's possible to modify the partner declarations. So the template used is the one that we provided. And if you change it, the, there is an issue of eligibility. Uh, said this, we are aware that James will come later. I still hope in January and not in February, but let's see. And uh, uh, it is it should be also very much clear to applicants that when uh, a, a lead applicant is asking to, to a project partner to sign a declaration, there has to be awareness of what the partner is signing. So for me, uh, the best moment in which a partner declaration can be signed is when the application form is available, including the budget, because they are committing themselves in funding the project with the money which is indicated in the budget. And therefore, I see rather difficult to have this transparent information uh -huh. that James no. is not there. However, still, still, I, uh, 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 let's say in theory, it is possible to have partner declarations signed before James is in place. And uh, for the field ID, pro project ID, you can then fill in later in, with a pen. And then you put the requested information and written instead of, uh, uh, instead of typed in uh, with the computer. It doesn't make a difference. But as I said, please beware that partner declarations are important commitments. Therefore, before signing, you should be aware of what you are committing. Therefore, we warmly invite you and recommend you that these partner declarations are signed when JAMS is already in place. Not for the ID, but for the, uh, for the awareness of the budget and the commitments. Thank you, Luca. Another question on the partner declaration. Um, okay, now, we learn that this has to be has to come later when you know what you're doing. So the next question is about how to fill it in correctly. Then. In the partner declaration, what should we write in the field partner number as listed in the application form? For example, project partner number one, project partner number two, etc., or just the number. And is the lead partner, the lead beneficiary, project partner number one, and then there's two, three, and whatever. Or do we have lead partner and then project partner number one? This question will be answered when, as soon as you have the gems there, so you will see it. But anyway, I can already anticipate to you that uh, the lead partner is the partner number one, and then there will be partner number two. So there is no lead partner in gems. It's just PP1, PP2, PP3, and so on and so forth. Okay, the next question is just moving up here because there's no, ah, that's already work plan. Let's see, let me check briefly with my colleagues that you don't see whether there's more questions coming. The uh, here, now it's coming, sorry, my computer is a bit slow. In the programming, the partnership agreement, it is not listed as an annex to the application. Can you please clarify if the partnership agreement needs to be signed and delivered at the application stage 
or only at the contracting stage, Luca? Um, no, the partnership agreement is not to be delivered when you apply. The partnership agreement is to be set up when you start the project. So no worries, there is no need to collect around Europe or Central Europe signatures of this document. This document is to be addressed after contracting. So even after the, let's say, the, uh, the, the subsidy contract is signed. So there is plenty of time. And this is then uh, to be requested only in case the project is approved. Thank you, Luca. We are already quite detailed for the general one, uh, I would like to say. <laughs> Um, and maybe also a quick word on what you see in Slido on the right. You see a question there by Anonymous uh, posted three days ago, and 23 of you are upvoting it. And you might be waiting for this desperately to get an answer. I can see this is the most liked question. This will always be there, but we will answer most of these questions in the other sessions. So we're still pushing up always the questions that Luca uh, can answer in this rather general framework session before we move into the next sessions. We have about 10 more minutes for you, Luca. So let's see how many questions are still coming for you. The next one is about additional docu documents. Do we understand correctly that associated partners, I suppose, do not need to provide any declaration? Only the data for the application form, section B2, Yes, <clears throat> this understanding is correct. No additional declarations, no letter of intent or things like that. Uh, only information in the application form. Uh, I just take the opportunity to remind that anyway, uh, associate partners have to have like a purpose in the project. It's not the quantity that makes the difference, it's the uh, relevance and appropriateness. And maybe, Frank, if there are no more questions for me, I'm also happy to hand over to my colleagues, in which for sure there will be more interesting questions. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Luca. And I think they're just waiting to get on uh, board and to answer all the questions on thematic scope, work and the development. But we have more questions for you. And here's another one. Will it be possible to paste in part C of the application dedicated to written explanation charts or di diagrams inclusive of text. So can you include charts or diagrams, I think is the question, in the application form? And is it foreseen, is there any kind of tutorial foreseen about GEMS prior to submission? And then there's a third one. Will GEMS permit to insert up to six work packages? Maybe before you start answering, Luca, I will answer the second one, and I will leave the first and the third uh, part of this question to you. Of course, we are planning a tutorial on GEMS. Uh, as you heard, the final version that you will be working with is not yet uh, live. So we will be preparing this. And when GEMS starts, you will also have a tutorial that you can then watch. And we will also have a more technical uh, question and answer webinar like this one on GEMS specifically. But then look at the floor is yours again. Yeah, very briefly. Um, unfortunately, it is not possible to copy, to paste into gems, charts, and graphs. So only text. The good thing is that anyway, copy paste is possible. So it is already something I would say. But unfortunately, no charts or, or graphs. And then uh, the third question was on the number of work packages. Uh, I have to say, uh, uh, as far as I know, it should be up to five work packages. But uh, uh, as I said, we have to wait when the final gems will be available. But as I think it is up to five uh, work packages, not six. But it is already a lot, five work packages, huh? Yes, indeed. I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the recommendation is uh, a lot less. Um, we will come, on, come to this, uh, to all these uh, further details in the latest session. Um, so, Luca, I have a last question for you because, before you can go back to a cup of coffee. And this last question that we have received on the general call framework is the proposer's evaluation procedure. Does it foresee a discussion or negotiation step with the eventual shortlisted proposers prior to the selection? Maybe you can also say something more generally on the uh, assessment and the contracting uh, process here um, so that we can cover that. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I mean, basically, uh, as you could see also in the time of reference for the call, the, the project 
assessment and selection occurs in two phases. There is a first phase in which we look at the more strategic aspects of the proposal. And there already some proposals might be rejected. And then those passing this first phase go into full assessment. And then there, there is the final decision for funding taken by our member states, which are uh, jointly working in the program monitoring committee. Uh, up to this point, there is no, uh, let's say, dialogue or, or discussion with applicants. Uh, uh, once the, mem the monitoring committee, the member states, take the decision for funding and they select the project proposals, then we enter into contracting, which is discussing with the lead applicant the, some conditions that eventually the program monitoring committee might have given to the project in order to be finally approved and funded. In this phase, then there is a, a discussion with the, the, between the lead applicant and the program authorities, meaning the joint secretariat, as in which we discussed such conditions and in case we come to, to, uh, uh, to revisions of the application form before it is finally funded. This is the only moment in which there is this discussion. But as I said, this is not part of the selection and assessment process. This is coming after, during contracting. Maybe um, a final question from my end. It was not asked. Um, just also thinking back to the co-launch event, we have an indicative budget, maybe just also to manage expectations. We are talking about selecting uh, project proposals. Do you have a rough number maybe of uh, how many proposals we might be financing after the first call then? Well, <clears throat> it very much depends on the size of the proposals, but roughly I would say that we could expect 35, 36, 37 uh, uh, applications in total. Then in the TOR, in the time of reference for the call, you have also the budget per priority. So you can easily make a, a calculation, uh, a, a calculation of how many proposals per priority you might expect, because not all priorities have the same size. But this is the so yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you for this. Thank you very much for this, Luca. Thank you for all your answers. Thank you for all the insights. I think also your last answer was a nice link to the next session that we have. So let's have a look into the second round. So in the second round, we will look into the thematic scope and the relevance of your projects. And here I will be joined by a number of key experts, including Jana Valkova for innovation topics, Victoria Dobrovets on energy, Lubor Jusko on environment topics, Winfried Ritt on transport, and last but not least, Christoph Ebermann on governance. Before we start, let's have a look now at the first question. So a first thematic question that we received was, is the focus of SO 1.2 on activities that concretely strengthen SMEs, or is it more on creating a scalable framework for them, or is it both? At this point, I would like to ask Jana, our innovation expert, to join me. Hello, Jana. Hello, good morning to you, Frank, and to all our audience. Good morning, hello. So maybe without much further ado, may I ask you to answer the first question, please? Yes, so the answer to this quite interesting question is yes, you can do both in your project. So your project can take, let's say, this downstreaming approach where you would focus really on working with the end users, which might be SMEs, but which might also be um, uh, startupers, or it might also be people who want to start their business and they are in the very initial phase um, of, of doing so. So you can focus really on fostering skills of employees and entrepreneurs in, in different fields in order to really help them um, adjust to digital transition, greening economy uh, requirements and so on and so forth. But at the same time in your project, you can take more 
so to say, upstreaming approach, where you would focus on, on, on establishing um, ecosystem for skills development in Central Europe, where you would focus on uh, improving capacities and competencies of policymakers and other stakeholders who are important, really, for building this um, fruitful framework. So um, to really help adapt regional skills development to industrial transition, digital transition, greening economy, and so on. Uh, your project can also focus on developing and fostering uh, knowledge hubs um, and innovative learning systems. So again, um, a kind of infrastructure for knowledge development, um, in a sense. So uh, you can do both in your project, or you can focus on, on downstreaming or upstreaming. Thank you very much, Jana. I'm just looking at Slido. It seems the next question is already on a different topic and there are no more questions so far on innovation. So if you have another question for Jana, please post it and we will bring her back for the moment. Thank you very much, Jana. And may I ask Victoria maybe to join me? I hope you are the right person now. Hello, Victoria. Uh, welcome all from my side. <laughs> Looking forward to my question. So, okay, then your question is, since the program document mentions energy efficiency improvements of district heating networks, will you finance the refurbishment of such networks? Uh, interesting uh, question. But first of all, to give you some uh, general overview, it should be clear when we talk about pilot investments, that are, they are only uh, foreseen uh, to implement activities uh, related uh, to pilot action. This means that uh, whichever pilot investment uh, you are planning within your project, it needs to be uh, for the purpose or the success of the pilot action. And for this particular uh, question, uh, it would be, and it would be interesting really to mention that we uh, do not um, finance a big investment, but rather investment on a small scale. And uh, what kind of uh, investments uh, are these to uh, clarify a little bit further? Uh, these investments linked to pilot action should have a demonstration character, model, or a pilot character. And if, of course, you are uh, interested to more uh, specific uh, discussion on your idea, then I would already now invite you to our individual consultation where uh, there is an opportunity really to discuss uh, each uh, individual idea and the relevance of such. Okay, thank you, Victoria, for this very concise answer. I can see that. Currently, there's no more question on energy topics. So thank you very much. I might bring you back in a bit later. So let's see if the audience out there will push some more questions on energy topics. But for the next question, I think my colleague Lubor is the right person to join me. Hello, Lubor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. So Lubor, question for you. Is it sufficient? to address within SO2.4 the issue of water pollution only at the local level while involving three or more Central European countries though? Mm -hmm. So to address this question, well, they, I would see two perspectives. So first one is transnationality perspective or eligibility. So from this, as you could see already in the terms of reference and, and all other uh, call documents, this project Alia would be eligible for funding. And another one uh, would be thematic perspective, because which aspects to address uh, should be uh, justified, it depends on the main objective of the project. That means, for instance, if you'd like to address source of pollution from trans transnational perspective, then of course, a local um, addressing of the issue would be sufficient. However, if you would be planning to conduct remediation measures of contamination, on let's say rivers, then as you know, contamination knows no administrative borders, then maybe you should consider uh, FUA level, so level of functional urban areas or, or transboundary 
aspects. For instance, we have a river Danube flowing through uh, for Central European countries. So then it would be logical or would make sense to address or involve in the partnership um, authorities responsible for uh, water management from these four countries. So it all depends on the objective of the project and what you want to achieve. And you should then pursue us uh, during application phase and also evaluation phase and also external experts, why this rational has been selected and why it is important for achieving a change and also of the uh, achievement of the project results. Thank you, Lubor. Please stay with me. Priority two to become greener in Central Europe is the biggest uh, priority that we have. And here we have a follow-up question for you, I think. Do you think that a project that has a recycling plant or pilot plant for the recovery of critical raw materials as its goal, but has a high research component, mm -hmm. is eligible for funding? Well, as it was already said, uh, we are not a research program. So research activities can be funded or, or can be addressed within our proposals, but it should be rather focused. Well, you should think about that uh, we are focused on regional development. So first of all, you should maybe rather focus uh, also on roll out of these activities, what you want to do, piloting, pilot demonstration, what you to achieve. If the whole project would be about the research, then unfortunately there will be maybe better programs to be addressed also as already uh, mentioned previously, like Horizon or, or Life that would be more suitable for addressing these. Thank you, Lubor. We are staying with the greener priority in a certain way, but we are moving away from your key topics, Lubor, it seems in Slido. So thank you very much for the time being. Maybe see you a little later. And the next question is for my colleague, Winfried. Hello, Winfried, how are you doing? Fine. Good Looking to see at you. Shirt, I'm quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you there. So, sustainable transport and low carbon mobility seem to be covered with SO 2.5 and 3.1. Are there more or other options for transport related projects? Can they also be submitted, let's say, under some energy SO innovation integrated regional development? Maybe? Yes, uh, Frank, you are right that the question is right. We have two specific objectives that are explicitly focused uh, uh, on mobility and transport. One of them is greening mobility in functional urban areas uh, as a part of the uh, zero carbon economy. And the second one aims at better connecting rural and peripheral areas. But of course, we can look at the transport sector also from a different perspective. For instance, there are value added chains of the automotive industries. There are uh, uh, batteries of e-cars as a resource for smart city projects. And of course, transport infrastructure development and regional development is closely linked uh, and can contribute also to governance, uh, new governance structured at uh, a regional scale. But uh, the, uh, uh, the main message is please focus on one of these objectives. And if you have doubts uh, where to put the project, we can offer these individual consultations. This is uh, uh, the tool that allows us to discuss with you in detail these issues if you have uh, a, a project idea that is already mature. And then we are happy to support you for your project idea. Thank you, Winfried. It seems that there is no other question for the time being on transport. Please, since this is a live webinar, some of the questions were sent to us in advance and we are now pushing them up for my colleagues like Winfried and Lubor and Jana. Please also send in your questions, uh, thematic questions for my colleagues. I understand that there are more questions for Jana, but before I call Jana back, I would like to give the floor to Christoph who is our governance expert, if I might say so. Hello, Christoph. Hello, Frank. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Christoph, a very brief question for you. Is it possible to finance cultural heritage projects in SO 4.1? Well, thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, it's actually a very interesting question because our SO 4.1 and our priority four in the new program 
is uh, special in the sense that uh, we did not have such a uh, specific objective in the current uh, Interreg CE program. Um, therefore, maybe let me uh, briefly explain what is the aim of actually this SO 4.1, which is about strengthening governance for integrated territorial development in Central Europe. And projects uh, to be supported in this SO 4.1 they must have these two, key, these two key elements included in it. One element is the, the governance element. So an improvement of the governance, uh, which is, for example, um, better participatory decision-making processes. It's uh, improved uh, policy making beyond administrative borders. So um, not only for uh, a city, but looking at the functional area as such, in order, and there we come to the uh, second element, which is um, in order to foster integrated territorial development. Integrated territorial development means this is um, these are approaches for which um, multi-sectoral answers are required in order to answer, for example, to complex challenges like demographic change, like uh, how to provide uh, public services of general interest in the same quality for different uh, territorial areas. Um, but we have also, of course, the climate change and also the tourism. So if we come to the question again, uh, can we fund a single cultural heritage project in SO 4.1? The answer would be, if the project is only focusing on the cultural heritage element, then no, it would not be enough because it's not looking into the governance and in the integrated territorial development component. However, if cultural heritage is a part of a broader concept of integrated territorial development, where a transnational level, for example, a governance yeah, no, is but... set up uh, for a territory with functional ties, then of course, cultural heritage elements could be included in there. So it's not that straight, it's straightforward, but it's at the same time, not straightforward. <laughs> yes, as, as Winfried was saying, in case of doubts, don't hesitate to come to these individual consultations where exactly we can go into these level of details. But I think the important message here is two elements need to be in the SO 4.1. And this is the words of governance and integrated territorial development. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, maybe there will be another question soon uh, coming for you. I can see that the next question is, as I said, going back to the innovation topics. So maybe Jana, may I ask you to join me once more? Hello. Yes, hello. So you probably have seen the question already. It's, I will read it out for all. Can a project on designing novel financial instruments and not grants for financing innovation, also pilot test these new instruments with SMEs during the project. For example, using an allocated amount of the grant received from Interact Central Europe for giving out to the SMEs involved in the pilot tests. So the straightforward answer to the question is actually no. What you can um, use the funding from our program for is developing the financial instrument, developing the tool, um, a transnational tool. So with your partners, you would work on, on uh, developing the system of it and how it should work. But then you cannot really use the funding from our program to fund other organizations. So to develop, um, let's say, a mini funding scheme within uh, your project, this is this is not possible. So um, I, I think the answer is pretty clear. We have examples of projects who were um, trying to develop these financial instruments or finance support schemes for social enterprises. Um, and what they did in the project is they developed the scheme and they are trying, they are now raising funds from other public sources, but also private sources um, to have funding in the scheme to be able to support the social startups. So um, our projects, some of them focus on this. So I would maybe suggest that you check our website. We have a look at projects in, in uh, current specific objective 1.2. And there are some examples of such projects. I can also tell, uh, seeing how this is being implemented in, in one of these projects, is that it's really um, ambitious and challenging task 
to develop a funding scheme to support innovation in companies and to raise enough money to make this work and, and to make this sustainable. Which doesn't mean that I'm trying to put you off from trying. Absolutely not. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. We have one more question for you. Can a project for PO1 focus on skills development and development of new innovative ways for organizing traditional businesses? So I see two, two questions in one. So I answer the first part about development of skills. In the first place, we're talking about a specific objective 1.2 within priority one that focuses on innovation. So if we talk about skills development, it's absolutely crucial that uh, you are developing skills for sectors which are relevant for smart specialization. So it might be industry 4.0, digitalization, green economy, bioeconomy, silver economy, uh, health and life sciences, also CCI, culture and creative industries, and so on and so forth. But it's important that the skills development focuses on, on, on these relevant areas for smart specialization. So you cannot really develop a new approach to teaching English in your region. You have to focus on something which is relevant in the regional um, innovation strategy for your own region. So that's one thing, but of course you can focus on skills development in your project. And the second part of the question is about um, innovative ways of organizing uh, uh, the business, was it about innovative ways of organizing production lines and organizing the business? So uh, for this, of course, you, you, you can focus on that in your project clearly, and you can try to help uh, as a means, maybe adopt some innovation aspects, may bring new technologies in their production lines. This is clearly the focus on specific objective 1.1. Uh, maybe just one footnote to this, if you want to focus on, on uh, topics that relate to circular economy, that you would try to help businesses become more, uh, more efficient in, in terms of circularity as well. Um, for that, we have a specific objective in priority number two, it's SO2.3. So depending of, of, on what you want to do, you should check whether your project idea fits better maybe to this objective or the objective and priority 1.1 and specific objective 1.1. Thank you for pointing this out, Jana. Very helpful. The next question will not be for you. So thank you very much. May I ask Victoria to join me? So, hello again. Hello again. I have an energy question for you. So, in SO2.1, energy poverty is mentioned among the actions that can be funded. But is it possible to present a proposal that is completely focused on energy poverty? Or is it better to integrate an energy poverty lens in a more comprehensive proposal? Uh, yes, it is correct that uh, in this programming period, uh, among other actions, we cover energy poverty as such. And I believe answer to this question is rather straightforward. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can focus uh, on energy poverty uh, activities, but uh, when talking about energy uh, poverty, it has uh, different uh, aspects of it. And uh, it includes, uh, I, I would say, even though within this activity, uh, many other activities. So it is fairly sufficient to cover uh, energy poverty. We have another one for you. <laughs> is it possible to finance the implementation of blockchain technology for a certain aspect in city governance in priority one or priority two for a pilot action? Well, thank you for this question. I would be focus. Uh, I would be focusing now mostly on answering whether it can be uh, uh, finance within priority two, and to be in line with what uh, my colleague Winfried uh, already said. Uh, it is uh, possible to have uh, a blockchain uh, as as a let's say 
tool uh, or means to, to achieve something. But when you are mm -hmm. developing uh, activities, within each priority or better say each specific objective, these activities needs to be focused uh, on tackling the challenges and needs of this uh, specific objective. And this goes same for priority one and priority two. You should really uh, focus your activity uh, on the specific objective with the blockchain as, as a tool as such. Thank you, Victoria. With this, yeah, I can, um, this, this is it for you. So thank you for the moment. Uh, the next question is for Lubor again. Hello, Lubor. Be back. Welcome back. Can under the specific goal 2.4, also, the following topics be funded. The management of green areas. Maybe we do it like this. You just say yes or no, and then you say something more general. So the management of green areas. Maybe I would, uh, can you please read through, and then I'll just take it from a... OK, so there is no clear answer on this, why the yes or no. So I will tell you all questions. So it's the management of green areas, as you can see, the arrangement of existing green areas and the creation of new green areas, irrigation systems, development of tactile parks, installing an outdoor gym on green areas? Mm. Well, maybe, uh, thank you for this question. Maybe a first recommendation to the applicants or those who are following us, please have a look at our documents. That means IP of the Central Europe Program where under the uh, SO 2.4 description of thematic fields, you will also find uh, description, clear description, what we want to support or we would, what, what we like to uh, see as indicative activities. And one of those is also biodiversity conservation and recovery, including in, in urban green areas. So from this perspective, um, it would be possible, of course, uh, to address uh, urban or creation of urban uh, greenery. Uh, or a green infrastructure. Uh, however, we would need to more, know more what is about this, what is the main objective. So maybe this question would be more suitable for individual consultation for application so that you would then explain to us also why do you need tactile park or, or some gym and which relation it has to creation of green infrastructures or the overall logic because now just to say yes or no it is it is uh, i would say quite uh, it's not not so 100% sure that yes of course put there a lot of a uh, lot of uh, gyms etc so so it, it really has to have a logic i i guess or my guess is that you would like to recover some maybe some um, industrial areas or uh, gray zones and turn it into some uh, greenery and on this you would like to identify some functional purpose for these areas so if there will be some logic to this that that you would like to find or or establish concrete functionality within these areas then of course we can we can also talk about uh, some 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 practical um, devices or or application of these areas but again it, it is on case by case basis and the best way would be to address us during the individual consultation and we can just discuss it, but it should not be about only establishing some, some uh, gyms, activity, parks, etc. So, so you should really focus on, on uh, biodiversity, conservation, and uh, um, yes, that would be for my side. Thank you, Lubor. Thank you very much, especially for pointing out uh, the individual consultations, because especially when it comes to thematic scope and the relevance of your project idea, and as Jana was saying before, whether you want to put it under 1.1 or under, if I'm not mistaken, circular economy is 2.3, um, I think that's really something that uh, you can still also sort out in uh, the individual consultations. So. For this session, because time is uh, quite advanced already, uh, I would like to thank you, Lubor. I would like to bring back my colleague Winfried for last two transport-related questions. I'm aware that there's more questions coming in now on innovation and all that. Um, if you think that these questions could be uh, answered also through our help desk, please address our help desk at helpdesk at interact-central.eu or just keep them for a individual consultation that you can book anytime. 
since Monday on this platform here. But let's come back to today, Winfrey. Good to see you back. I have a question for you on e-mobility. There is a project idea by Carole Magnon uh, on e-mobility, e-boats. And they are hesitating between the innovation priority, the technology is innovative, uh, she writes, and the green mobility priority. And I think it's pretty much linked to what I was just saying. So maybe a short answer from your end, Winfrey. Yes. Uh, a short answer is, uh, uh, are you coming from Venice? Because then I kind of think that e-boats or boats are the backbone of the mobility system of the city and also linking the city with the hinterland. Yeah? Uh, uh, so uh, a more comprehensive package, not a single technology, not a single uh, way of transport. Uh, I think you, you need a bigger story behind this technology. Um, and if you're not coming from Venice, uh, it is similar to the first answer in this triangle between innovation, energy and mobility you have to focus and clearly address one of the objectives and then we discuss during individual consultation. Thank you, Winfrey. That was to the point. And we have one more for you. And actually then uh, just a word of warning already for my colleague Christoph, I will not stop after Winfried with this session. There's also now a question for you coming after this. But first, transport. Is it possible to realize infrastructural pilot projects related to the electrification of ports located in urban areas to limit the emission in the atmosphere due to diesel motors? If yes, is there a limit in the amount of infrastructural investment? Are there limits in its use, Winfrey? Uh, if I understand this question right, it's about how to embed investment in transnational projects. And this is always a bit tricky because we are not an investing uh, investment from per se, no big infrastructure, no big investment. We are cooperation in the context of regional development. So our pilot, uh, our investments need a pilot character, a demonstrator. So if you're doing something new, uh, and if this is also interesting for other partners, and of course we have several ports in uh, Northern Adriatic or the Baltic Sea, and if those ports are interested in similar issues and can make a step forward um, to bringing ports activities linking uh, with the uh, uh, intermodal transport chain, this could be a part of a project. But of course, the project need a wider scope. But this is a way how to integrate such investments with pilot character uh, and into a transnational project. So this is possible, yes. Thank you, Winfried. And indeed, and, uh, this is always kind of like a question that uh, many projects have. And again, this is something uh, where you can discuss the details also very well in uh, the individual consultation of how to integrate uh, investments that have a pilot character. Thank you very much, Winfried. And with that, um, since it is already close to 11, uh, a last question on thematic scope maybe uh, that is addressed at you, Christoph. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hello. So the support to local and regional governance structures that encourage circularity can match to transnational cooperation if the project proposes the adoption of a common innovative approach. So. Well, the, what is not in the question, unfortunately, whether it is, uh, whether the applicant wants to go in the direction of the SO 4.1, but in case, since we have the word of governance in there, I would presume it's addressed to 4.1. The key question here is, is it about improving the governance processes? What I could read in the question, yes, it is. And then the second question is, is it about um, integrated territorial development for solving complex challenges? Uh, circularity is a complex challenge which will need a multi-sectoral answer. So theoretically, this can be addressed in here, but uh, I'm very happy to discuss this further in an individual consultation on, uh, on the SO 4.1. But this is exactly the idea, these two topics uh, as mentioned, um, improved governance processes and integrated territorial development. These are a must in SO 4.1. Thank you, Christoph. And with this, I would like to come to an end of this round of questions and answers. As you can see, the thematic scope, our program is quite focused. At the same time, it is also quite broad. We are financing many, many actions, and it's very 
hard to say straight away in such a short Q&A webinar, yes, this is going to be relevant, this is what you can do, this is what you should be going for. So again, the encouragement to really make use uh, of the individual consultations. Um, maybe uh, at the same time, I would like to point out there can be only one individual consultation per project idea, unfortunately. Um, we already have, I think, more than 80 ideas uh, here on the community. And uh, as you can imagine, um, it would be difficult to offer multiple consultations for each of these ideas. So while I, am, I want to encourage you to make use of these consultations, also make sure that your project idea is already in a quite advanced stage, that you have a good grasp on who you want to involve in your project idea, what you want to do, and, um, and then come with very concrete questions. And we will help you to develop a good uh, project proposal. So at this stage, I think it is time to look into the third round of our question and answer webinar. And in this round, we will look into the project work plan development. And our key expert here, may be supported by others, we will see, but the key expert you just heard in the last session is Christoph Ebermann, who is not only an expert on governance, but he's also our deputy head of monitoring and evaluation. So let's have a look at the first question in this session. The kickoff question here. The program manual contains a list of specific output types. Is it recommended to cover all these output types within a single project? Before I ask this question to Christoph, I would like to ask it to you out there. You will see a Slido poll and the question is quite straightforward. So we opted for yes and no. And I would be interested since I think if I remember right, more than 75% of you read some of the program documents already. How would you understand this requirement? Is there a need to cover all output types within the single project or is it fine if you just cover a few of them? 120 answers, 130. Maybe Christopher, I can ask you to join me already. So different type of questions now. You see the answer, I hope. 84% are saying, no, you don't have to cover all output types. Are you happy with that response? Yes, I'm very happy. And it's very good to see that uh, so many participants have already gone into our documents. And as we heard before, have already even read all documents, which is a co quite comprehensive set, even though, of course, we try to be as sharp as possible in, in the documents. But um, uh, maybe to come to the question asked, um, maybe just to, to point this out. Indeed, we have uh, four different uh, output types, which we have defined at program level. Uh, we have corporations, we have strategies and action plans, we have pilot actions, and we have solutions. And um, I could see previously in, in Slido, there are quite some questions related to these outputs and these output types. So maybe just in general, the only output type which is mandatory for all projects is the output type of corporations. This one is actually uh, directly accomplished by all projects uh, once your project is funded because this corporation is then already established. When it comes to the other output types, they need to fit to what you want to do with your project. So the output types need to match your project goals. If your project is more uh, uh, policy oriented, then you will work more with strategies and action plans. If your project is more implementation oriented, you will work more with pilot actions and solutions, or your project can have both. For example, in one work package, you work on a strategy and action plan, and in another work package, you work on a pilot action, and in the third one, uh, you will have a derived solution. So this is really up to you, but the key message is your outputs need to be consistent with your project objectives. If I remember right, Christoph, since you were saying something, um, 
since you were quite comprehensive on these output types now, if I remember right, a question that we received in advance, and this is not going to be pushed up now on Slido because this is coming from my uh, memory, there was a question like, okay, there's this output type, strategies and action plans. And I think the question was, do I need to do both if I covered that? Do I have to have a strategy and an action plan or can I just have an action plan? Yeah, this is actually a very interesting question. Um, um, and uh, I found it really good that it was listed among the questions posted in, in Slido. Well, the strategies and the action plans, they are somehow interrelated. Um, there is no obligation to do both, but there is a link between both of them. Because if you're doing a strategy, you can also, at the strategy, at the end of the process and with the strategy, but then the output is the strategy. But for the adoption of the strategy, you need uh, some institutions which are taking it up and should already start implementing the strategy. That is how it is also then defined in the result indicator. If you have an action plan, the action plan needs to be derived from something. The action plan needs to be derived from a jointly developed strategy. So it's up to you whether you want to read already to stay at the more strategic level or whether you want to operationalize your strategy into an action plan. And for this, um, I would recommend to you to have a look at this Annex 6, which is actually, uh, it's the Annex 6 to the program manual, which includes the definitions of the uh, indicators uh, where you know we have output indicators and result indicators. And uh, there are exactly these explanations on what is expected in terms of, for example, a strategy to be uptaken, when, how, when is it considered as uptake and what needs to be done. But I think it's a very good question and I hope we could clarify it with this. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was very clear. When it comes to you now mentioned Annex 6. We know that most people have read just some of our documents yet, so maybe Annex 6 was not among them. Uh, at the same time, I think I can see from the questions that were addressed as, as, uh, in advance to this uh, Q&A webinar that there are some very, very specific questions also. We will see in how far we can cover them. So maybe also on this session, on this round, Christoph and I, we will primarily be discussing the questions where we believe that there's a huge interest by most of the participants today. And the more specific your question becomes, it might, why well, there might be no time, um, even though we now extend the webinar to answer this. So again, please do not believe that we do not want to answer it, just address it to our help desk at helpdesk at, uh, at interact-center.eu. And now maybe come, let's come to the most upvoted question of the day by far, Christoph. And that has to do with a choice that the program took deliberately. And, and that is a huge change, I believe, for many of the applicants out there. And this is probably the reason why it was upvoted so much. The question is, because there's no separate work package for management or communication anymore. And these actions should be included within the thematic work packages the person asking would like to make sure that activities such as the kickoff meeting, a final conference, or the updating of the website should be separately defined activities. Or how do you include this in the work plan? What do you do with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not surprised that this question is voted the, the highest. And uh, it is, as you pointed out, one of the biggest changes when it comes to the work plan, that uh, the new work plan and this uh, upcoming Interact CE program is uh, only focusing on thematic work packages. This, there are indeed no work package management and no work package communication. The reasoning basically is uh, that the management activities, they are horizontal activities, which are concerning all the work packages. And um, there are the requirements in terms of reporting, for example, towards the program. They are defined anyway in the program manual and in the subsidy contract. So there's no need to repeat it in the, in, in the work plan. When it comes to uh, describing how you're going to set up the management, how you are planning to coordinate your partnership, 
Um, what, how, which measures in terms of quality assurance are you going to put in place? There is this section C7 in the application form where it is exactly about this point on uh, where you should uh, describe how, how have you foreseen your management setup. And now if we come concretely to the work plan as such, management activities like a kickoff meeting should not be listed as an activity in the work plan. So any also partner meetings or project steering committee meetings, all these management meetings should not be part of the work plan. The work plan is only about uh, thematic activities. And in this regard, uh, since we are having the final conference in there uh, in the question, uh, please note that communication activities are considered as integral part of the thematic activities. Because the final conference, I think it's really an excellent example. You don't do the final conference because you need to do a final conference, but you should do the final conference because you want to communicate your uh, final results of your project, because you want to communicate your um, outputs, which you have achieved to a targeted audience. And so this is exactly something uh, when you have achieved your uh, outputs that you can write within the activities that in order to promote these outputs and in order to address your target groups and in order to convince, for example, your stakeholders of the usefulness of uh, these outputs, you will involve them in a final conference. And this will be an integral part of the work plan. But I'm sure, Frank, you, you can also say something um, further on this communication part because the question also included uh, the website, for example. Yes, the website, but maybe also on the final conference briefly. I, I think um, it is important to also point out we do not expect a final conference. There's no obligation to do a final conference. So it might be the best possible way to roll out your results and present them, as Christoph said, uh, to your stakeholders. Um, and then it's always linked to a thematic activity. But there might be other ways. If you have a digital product that is new, um, maybe it is not the best way to have a, an on-site event to present something digital. Maybe you want to roll this out in a big digital campaign that could also come at the end of the project. So don't always think like, um, we need to have a launch conference, we need to have a final conference. And I remember very well from uh, a few years ago, midterm conferences also. You don't need that. Just um, think about in communications. Um, communication is there to make visible what you do and what you achieve. So it's always linked, as Christoph said, to some thematic activity, and you can describe it in the application form in the activity description part. You will see that. There's also a tutorial, uh, by the way, on communications in the application uh, form for those that haven't watched it. There, uh, and there's also a tutorial by Christoph on, on more general other issues of work plan development. Now, the website is basically like, um, uh, the updating of the website is basically like organizing the kickoff meeting. So you will have to do this. It's an obligatory measure. The project website has to be updated. You have to provide information on the project website about how your project is actually proceeding. And um, since it is obligatory, there's no need to foresee this in the work plan. You don't have to put it anywhere. Uh, but of course, I mean, staff costs, uh, you need to plan for that. It will take, it will take time. So you need to consider that. Um, uh, but yeah, that would be the answer in brief. So Christoph, let's have a look at the next question at you or me, or maybe we can push something to our finance colleagues later. <laughs> we have another question upvoted 13 times, not as much, but uh, also pretty often. It is recommended to define no more than four to six activities per work package. However, what, what, what shall applicants do if there are six pilot actions foreseen in one work package? And then probably something for me to answer. And then there's no space for communication activities. Is it acceptable to increase the number of activities and deliverables per work package in justified cases? And will it be technically possible in GEMS? Yes, I think this is a question which indeed came several times uh, throughout the large set of questions which we received today. And, uh, and I fully understand that question because uh, uh, indeed, if you look at our former work plans in the, in the current program and the, or like in the 1420 program, 
then um, there were a lot of little details in there. And um, this is a bit the lessons learned, which we will try to uh, implement in this uh, forthcoming interreg CE program, is that um, the work plan should not be too fragmented. Um, there is one big difference, uh, which is there is no space to describe your activities. So the activities should be the main implementation steps which are allowing you to achieve your outputs and to achieve your project objectives. So within your activities, you can describe quite a lot of sub activities which are taking place, like for example, communication activities, which we like the final conference, we, which we were talking about or any other campaign you plan in this regard. So you, there is not the need to create an additional activity on communication uh, just for creating one it should be part of your thematic activities and with regards to your to the question of the six pilot actions this in the end it's uh, it's up to the project uh, uh, or up to the you as an applicant how to set it up whether you have uh, one activity per pilot action or whether one activity covers all the pilot actions it's uh, it's uh, so you can uh, structure the work plan as it fits best your needs. Uh, the activities should be the main implementation steps. Um, and with regards to the recommendation, when it comes to the number of activities, but also to the number of deliverables, because this question also came off, as I could see in Slido, this is a recommendation. So we are recommending for you to not to have a too fragmented work plan. Um, so we have the recommendation to have not more than four to six activities per work package. And per activity, you must have at least one deliverable, but it's recommended to have not more than three. But it's a recommendation. If for due to the complexity of your activities or the long duration of your activities, you need more deliverables or you need more activities, this is, of course, okay from the side of the program, and this is also technically possible from the side of GEMS. And I think it is important um, in terms of activities uh, related to communications. There's always space for communications, even if it is not a standalone activity as such, it can always be integrated in the description. So if you have a pilot activity right there, what if you, if you plan, for example, a visit of uh, influencers, uh, Instagram uh, people or journalists uh, to this site in order to make it better known what you're doing there, just write a sentence there in the description and that's good enough. And I think this is the crucial new way of thinking. We would like to know what you roughly have in mind, but when you bring on the communication experts at a later stage, when you start implementing your project, when you've been selected and you start implementation, this person will still have a certain flexibility to interpret your one sentence there and to make the best communication that fits in the best way with his or her expert uh, knowledge that they will bring in to your project, usually at a later stage, meaning uh, once you're financed and not in the application stage. Um, so I think just to explain also why communication is treated like this. So let's have a look at the next question then. Are you ready, Christoph? Sure. Can you explain in more detail the output solutions? Does it have to be always derived from a pilot action? If a solution is already an existing solution, does this mean it can come also from another output like a tool? Yeah, I think this is also a very valid question because the solution, it's something new in this interreg CE program. Um, and indeed, a solution can be a procedure, it can be an instrument, it can be a tool, it can be a service. Um, but every solution needs indeed to be derived from a pilot action. Um, I think in order to explain what the solution is about, Maybe just to take a practical example. A project could, for example, develop a draft tool or draft service in order to solve a problem or solve a challenge at the identified the territorial level. Um, 
Then the project goes into a pilot action where they are testing this tool or the service, whether it is working, uh, their the part partners are improving the tool and the service. And then the pilot action is over, but the tool is not yet um, improved. And this is exactly what is necessary for the solution. So derived from the learnings from the pilot action, and taking into consideration the needs of the targeted user and how the user uh, can then use this uh, and put in practice this solution. All this knowledge is put together and the solution for this challenge or this problem which has been identified is being developed. Maybe one point I would like to stress because this is really an important point in the new intervention logic of this new Interact CE program is the joint development. Um, as you might have noticed uh, when looking into our program manual, but especially if you have discovered already the Annex 6 of the program manual, I will repeat this Annex 6 because it's really an important document, um, that there's always reference to jointly developed. This applies to the solution, uh, jointly developed and implemented applies to the pilot action. Um, it applies also for the strategy. Uh, so this means that at least partners from two countries must have worked together on this respective solution or on this respective pilot action. So this cooperation element is really essential. It should be the heart of every project which is submitted in the frame of uh, this call, and it should be the heart of all the outputs which are being developed and this is what you can see then also in the solution really this knowledge being brought together in order to have a solution which can then be taken up by organization and rolled out in the territories so i enlarged a bit the question but i think this aspect on this jointly developed is really really important and uh, i just wanted to underline this here thank you krista we have less than 10 minutes left for you so let's maybe speed up a little bit let's have a few more questions uh, sure. that we will try to answer in this q a webinar um so the next one is on trainings you were saying that solutions are the new ones trainings are dropped it seems to some people trainings are no longer considered as outputs how shall this be interpreted yeah well, i will not read out the interpretation here because we want an answer from you now <laughs> Well, the thing is, uh, trainings are not less important than before, but they are not at the level of an output ca uh, categorized and covered by output uh, indicators. Nevertheless, cap capacity building measures are foreseen and are described in the program manual. They can be conducted, but the project cannot focus solely on a training. We are not a training program. However, a project can uh, focus and should focus on project outputs. So I think this is a bit the difference. Um, a training can be a tool of capacity building in order to reach uh, the outputs as foreseen by the project. Yeah, thank you very much, Christoph. I think one of the reasons is also if you want to do a uh, training, uh, ESF is probably also a better program. So um, we really need to also be different from other funding sources that are offered on the European level. Next question then, for investments in infrastructure, we had investments before, do technical and legal requirements and permissions associated to the investment have to be already available in the phase of the project application submission? Well, we often see in practice that uh, investments are a bit a tricky part in a project because it's not foreseeable how quickly one will get all the uh, uh, the, the, the legal or will be able to fulfill all the legal requirements, uh, get the construction company, uh, the weather conditions, etc. So we see a lot of challenges in our ongoing projects with the, with the, um, uh, with the investments. And so ideally, everything should be, uh, all the permits and everything should already be available at the application stage. But of course, we are aware that often during the project, uh, and in the frame of the specification, for example, of uh, a pilot action, because actually, just to mention it here, an investment needs always to be linked to a pilot action. There cannot be an investment without a pilot action. Um, so maybe in the frame of the pilot action, there's the need to refine exactly what is to be done on which side, 
So you cannot yet have every per all the permits. So it's okay to have the permits and to get the permits during the project implementation, but then you should um, show convincingly in the application form that you are aware of the permits you need to get and that it is timely possible to get them in order to not delay the overall project implementation. That sounds quite logical to me. So let's see then with the next uh, one, there is a number one. Uh, so this person probably had more than that question. Uh, we will focus on this one now. Does each work package need a different work package leader or can one project partner have the lead in all work packages? Ah, no, there's the number two. Sorry, I thought a project specific objective. How will it be measured? Will it be measured by activities, deliverables, and outputs, or by which standard? But maybe I stick maybe to the, the work package leader and then we go to the next, uh, to the number yeah. two. Um, I think the work package leader, I've seen this also in other questions posted on Slido. I think it's uh, also a very interesting, interesting and valid point. Um, you might have noticed uh, going into the application form template that there is no box at the top of the work packages to be filled in who is the responsible partner for this work package, um, which in the past we always had there. Um, I think having a work package leader and having shared roles in terms of management inside the project is really a good practice and should be continued. It is very important that different partners according to their experience, expertise, and competences are taking over active roles in the project in order to, to manage it and to uh, support the, the coordination and the quality check at the work package level. So this information, even though there is not this text box in the, uh, in the work packages, there is the section B uh, where for each partner it is to be described which role this partner has in the project. So please describe in there, if this partner has the role as a work package leader, please mention it there because this is the role the partner will have in the project. And then it allows us to see, ah, yeah, that it's, it's clear, it's matching the competences and experiences and it makes a lot of sense to have it like that. And for the question on whether we can have, or whether it is possible to have the same work package leader for all the work packages, or maybe the lead partner does it all. Yes, technically it's possible, but we are in a transnational cooperation context. And um, it should be, the implementation should be also done transnationally, this shared among the partners. I believe that if one partner does it all, this would not really fit to this transnational cooperation spirit. And Christoph, then I think this is clear. The second question, is this um, the project specific objective? How will this be measured? Um, is this question clear to you? Can you also give well, a well, I can. Yes, I think, I think this is also maybe an interesting point to point out. Um, for those who have been with us in the 1420 program, project specific objectives were defined at the beginning of the project and a bit later in the, in the application form, the work packages were defined. Now, the project specific objectives are defined at the level of each work package. So within each work package, one has to define a project specific objective, a communication objective, the activities which lead as main implementation steps to the achievement of these objectives, the related deliverables documenting this, and the outputs of this work package. So the achievement of your project specific objective needs to be demonstrated through the achievement of the respective work package. This, uh, it is measured through everything what is in this work package, meaning the activities, the deliverables, and of course the outputs, which is the core part and which is also covered by the indicator system. Thank you, Christoph. We have one more question before we need to move on into budget development, I'm afraid. Is it necessary to have a pre-approval of an additional project website? When is this pre-approval needed? Christoph, I suggest we share this question. I will take the first part and you say uh, something about the second one, because there's other occasions where you need pre-approvals for something probably. Mm -hmm. So this might go beyond the website. So additional project website. Well, you can ask for a pre-approval of an additional project website, but we will not grant it. There is one project website. On that website, 
and this will be integrated into our new program website once we launch it towards the end of next year. So very well in time uh, before you will start uh, communicating your projects. On this project website should be all information about what you're doing and what you're achieving. So this would be the website where you provide general information, where you show the process, um, where you provide news, where you advertise events, etc. Now, there might be the case that you create a certain product, an output could be a product, a tool. And this is uh, something more complex and you cannot uh, have this as part of our um, pro of the project website on our program website. In that case, you can do an additional website if you want so. I think a good example, maybe to make it very clear what, uh, what I mean by this is, think of our program, think of this call now. When you're looking for concrete information on what is going on with the call, where do we stand? Is there, where are the documents? Where is the, where are the events and all that? For that, all of you are going to our program website. Now, we believe that in these times, we need something more than just a website and events. We need to give you also a space to meet, to exchange to post and browse and exchange on project ideas. So what we did, we created the community that we are now hosting this event on also. And this community is kind of, in that understanding, I would say, a second website. It's not integrated with our program website because it is a totally different tool. So it is apart from this. If you want to do something, so your project website is like our program website, all the information should go there. But if you have a tool that is needed in the frame of your uh, project, or if you create something for your stakeholders, then ideally you integrate this already, you say this already in your application form. If you tell us like we are thinking of creating a community, we are creating a, a tool, a digital platform, for uh, waste heat, catastrophe, um, documentation, whatever, um, say it as early as possible. Christoph, maybe you want to uh, close on this. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you said it all. I think the important point is that uh, uh, it needs to be linked to the contents of the project. And uh, if you are really developing a, a, a product which should be available online and kept online afterwards, uh, which goes beyond uh, just the general promotion of uh, what your project has achieved, uh, but it's a real product, then, then of course we are open to that. But the general message is please do not create additional websites. We, we, we have seen in the past that many of these websites are not so durable, not, uh, not remaining that long. And this is not what we're aiming for. We are trying to initiate uh, further developments. And, uh, and if we see it is linked to a content activity, please include it in the application form and describe it, what you plan and how you plan it. Thank you very much, Christoph. And with this, I think I can release you. There is many more questions for you. Um, people might just write these uh, questions to helpdesk at info at interact-central.eu and uh, then they will land on your desk and you will be answering them. But for today, thank you very much uh, for joining and for providing all these answers. So I hope you like our new product, the community on which we're also hosting this uh, webinar. So let's come to a final round actually 90 minutes have passed very quickly 90 minutes are over so now i would like to start the last session because you gave me some time to extend so let's have a look into what we will be doing there so in this last session we will touch on project budget development and state aid we have received many, 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 many questions on this. A lot of them already very detailed. So we have about 20 minutes left, maybe a little bit longer. Let's say we will probably extend until 12 o'clock so that my colleagues and key experts in this round, Helga Portelli, Head of Finance, and Christina Glumatz, our state head expert, have a bit of time to share with you what um, what you have to do there, what we expect from you and how to do the budget right and how to get state aid right. So let's not waste more time. Let's have a look at the first question straight away.
So the kickoff question, will there be an Excel file to help with the budget development? From the offline template of the application form, it is not clear how some budget sections are calculated. It would be particularly important to understand how the calculations of the lump sums work, for example. And with this question, I would like to invite Helga to join me. Hello, Helga. Hello, Frank. Good morning from my end, too, and good morning to the audience. Helga, so I'm sorry. You I'm, I'm sorry you had to wait a little bit longer. It's not a problem <laughs> whatsoever. It's always interesting to, uh, and also it helps to know what now we can, uh, someone has already answered certain things as well. So maybe to, for the first question, may I ask, will there question. be an Excel file? No, there will not be an Excel file in the um, template that we have provided of the offline application form. We have provided guidance there on what needs to be um, included in the budget section. And we have also uh, shown where it is automatically calculated. There are many cells, many budget tables that are automatically calculated. What is to be kept in mind, what is important is that uh, the budget has to be included at the level of the partner and the partner has to there decide. There are many op different options. So there are the simplified cost options that if a partner has to decide which are the best options for him and the budget then has to be filled in at the level of the partner, cost category and period. And maybe because there was also a reference to the lump sum. There is only one kind of lump sum in our program, and that is the lump sum for preparation and contracting costs, which if uh, the applicants want to have reimbursed, they have to include in the specific section in the application form, section E of the application form. And in short, this is 17,500 of total costs, which can be either allocated to one partner or to split between partners. Thank you. Thank you, Helga. Maybe on this, there's also our tutorials um, on um, budget development, and um, there's one on state aid, there's one on budget in the application form, on, on cost categories. Um, so uh, if uh, Helga is talking uh, about things that you really have difficulties probably to follow uh, without having read the documents yet, also a recommendation to maybe watch the tutorials and then come back to the recording of this webinar to listen again to uh, how Hega is making this even more precise for you. Cas cost categories. The next uh, question for you, Hega. According to the application form template, the budget must be entered in GEMS in the following way. Cost categories, is it times period? I'm, I don't know. You will understand, Hega, I hope. Yes. It will therefore not be necessary to indicate the budget for work packages and activities in GEMS, or is it expected that, uh, to create additional windows within the system? So as I um, also just mentioned, it is at project partner level and each partner has to divide its budget per cost category and then per cost category per period. Uh, we do not have the budget at work package level and there is no place where to add any additional information for the budget from a work package perspective. What I just a hint, please do not forget the famous work package management and work package communication, even though it is not in the work plan, even it's not part of the application form. When building the budget, always keep that. You need to uh, include this in your budget. Yeah, especially in staff costs, uh, I reckon uh, you need to think about that because it uh, is time consuming. Also in external expertise. I mean, it's in, in, in other, you know, yeah, in all the, the cost categories, you have to keep Actually this in, mind. in all. So before I start asking any questions, I have another one coming from the audience, Helga. Given that there is no specific work package management, where should we include the details of external costs? Actually, this is right uh, way linked to what we were talking about. Exactly. Uh, as we mentioned, there is no budget at the work package level. Your budget is simply at the partner, cost category, and period level. And then if for, for the um, cost category four, which is external expertise and services, you have to give uh, specific 
there, there are places where you put the description of each uh, contract and services that you need there. And this is where you also include costs, for example, for um, control costs or for managing the project. There it would be in the description of the specific cost category. Ega, I understand this is new. This is really different from how it was in the past, if I'm not mistaken. It is. is it just us? <laughs> or no. where is this coming from? Well, actually, we had uh, we have a core group of programs of Interact programs working hand in hand with Interact, where we try to harmonize uh, our tools as much as possible, and this is one of the harmonization that we have uh, come up with. Most uh, Interact programs will not have work packages, even in in the in the. Um, Programming period 1420, there were some programs that had already done away with work packages. So for some, and it might it's be. Also, just uh, as, as, an, as an explanation, it's also when, when um, we got feedback that when you are implementing the project and when you are um, claiming costs, it's very difficult to segment the costs according to work packages because everything is so much linked. And then it became very artificial splitting. So since, since we know that uh, most of you are probably not exclusively working with Interact Central Europe, this approach might be even familiar to some of you. That's uh, probably good news. So let's have a look at the next question then. Is it still valid that budget related to partners outside the program area can only be 20% of the total project budget? No, this there has been a, um, a revision, uh, not a revision, the, the uh, regulations uh, have now um, different rules and it's no longer that it is limited to 20%, it could be more than the 20%. So this is not limited. So, so if not you have a partner coming from a, a new country, from outside Central Europe area, then the, the budget is not limited. So before it was European legislation limiting us uh, a little bit and now we have exactly. more. Exactly, now it is more yeah. flexible. Okay, very good. Uh, to calculate personnel costs um, and not to choose the flat uh, rate approach, but the real costs. Um, can we consider the person's cost related to the concluded fiscal year, the most recent one, or can we only consider the actual person's cost incurred and paid out of the months related to the reporting period? Well, here we have to see at what, at which level we are. Is it at application stage or is it at implementation stage? Mm -hmm. When we look at application stage, when we are preparing the budget at application stage, we can look at the previous fiscal year, of course, to get uh, to, to decide and see to have as much as possible the budget based on a realistic uh, figure. However, when it comes to implementation, then it is not the previous fiscal year, but it's the actual amounts that are paid in the specific month. Thank you, Hega. Okay, the next question is three questions. Are you ready? <laughs> Shall we go for it? I'm ready, always ready. Actually, it's only two I can see. The first one was already answered by Luca in the beginning. So a little less for you, Hega. Let's start with the first one that is for you, is the cost of renting a vehicle for the occasional transport of vulnerable, vulnerable groups allowed? Okay, now, when you look at the eligibility rules in our program manual, this would very clearly be eligible under cost category five, which is equipment. However, I would really like to emphasize something here, that costs have to always be linked to the content of the project. And they have to be deeded for reaching the objective of the project. So even though something might be listed as eligible, if it is not, if it's just part of the shopping list, it's not okay. It has to be linked to the project objectives. And uh, I will also maybe repeat what Christoph has, has mentioned uh, with regards to investments, that these have to only be foreseen if they are necessary for the implementation of the project activities and linked to pilot actions. We will not, uh, we will continue repeating this so that it's very clear. <laughs> 
Thank you, Helga. We are no research program and we are no investment program. I think this is always... Uh... Now I lost the... I think I lost the second question. Well, the second question, to be you honest, remember? I, I, I have seen it, uh, yes. And it was, are the costs of adaptation and furnishing, if I remember correctly, of the space yeah. for end users, something like that. I think the, the answer is very similar to what I have said about equipment. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, it, if you look at the eligibility, it is, but. Yeah, and I think this is a crucial link. I mean, the, um, I mean, Many things might be possible, but they have to make sense. Exactly. <laughs> it needs to be clear what do you do it for, what you spend the money for, and uh, in how far it contributes to the project success in the end. Infrastructure and equipment, is there a threshold or can we adjust the budget as we want? There are no budget in thresholds. And you have to always keep in mind that we always want to see a realistic budget. So no, no thresholds and keep in mind being realistic and all that I have already said about investments applies even here. Even more so, I would even say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. I, as I said before, Helga, a lot of the questions that we received in advance and that we're still receiving seem to be very, very specific. So there's even people have been reading the documents. I think that's good news. And they're making reference to yes. certain pages and articles that uh, you have full grasp on, I'm sure. So here is a clarification question on the full purchase of the equipment can be regarded as eligible. However, depreciation is eligible if in line with national rules on the matter. This was probably drafted even by you. So here yes. is a person wondering which are the criteria to decide whether to apply depreciation or rather not. So basically the program rule is that if the equipment is used for the project purposes only, then the full cost can be regarded as eligible. In the previous programming period, we used to distinguish between whether an equipment is for office use or, and in that case, it needed to be depreciated, or if the equipment was for thematic use, where the full cost was eligible. We've seen that this sometimes created issues, and we tried to simplify, saying that equipment, whether for office use or for thematic use, from the program perspective, can be 100% funded. However, sometimes in the institutions, from an accounting point of view, it is not possible to account 100% and they would want to uh, account just the depreciation part. And this, if the depreciation uh, rules are applied um, correctly, then it would be eligible to just include the depreciation. But from a program perspective, it is possible that the full cost is regarded as eligible. Okay. Thank you, Helga. Since there's the two of you, I would suggest we direct one more question at you and then bring in uh, state aid. I, I mean, you can also sure. stay and answer the state aid questions maybe, but I I will pass on the board. probably better bring in Christina then. Okay, let's have a look at the next budget question. Cost option three. Program manual, the program manual states that external expertise and services, as well as equipment and infrastructure are reimbursed on the basis of real costs. We kindly ask for clarification. Is any documentation or proof of payment needed under cost option three or not? So when reporting towards, if, so just to, to explain what cost option three is, because may, maybe some are saying what is cost option three. Thank you. <laughs> this is the simplified cost option uh, possible for a partner to choose that uh, all uh, direct costs other than staff costs, meaning cost categories from two to six, are calculated as 40% of direct staff costs. So this is what option three is, is all about. So it is a simplified cost option, 40% of staff costs. When reporting towards the, um, towards the controllers, the 40% does not need to be documented. There, you do not need to provide any proof of payment, anything. It's just you have staff costs, the controllers will check the staff costs, and based on those, the 40% will apply. So from that aspect, documentation is not required. 
However, there were some other questions about this option. And I want to say that, uh, of course, from a, from a work plan perspective, what is going to be carried out by that partner who selected the uh, simplified cost, this simplified cost option would still need to be described in the work plan. So even though, as I said, documentation towards the controllers, you do not have to show it, but the, the, in, the, in the content perspective, you have to provide information on what you're doing. Erika, I'm pretty sure you're talking to finance experts out there. <laughs> so I Well, if sure they, they post it. these questions, they know what I'm talking for, about. For me, this, this is a dialogue and a different word for me. I'm a communication person. So very interesting to listen to you. Thank you for the questions. Maybe the next question then, to give you a short break, I will bring you back in a second. Let's have a look at state aid maybe. Um, Christina. Hello, Christina. Hello, Frank. Hello, everyone. As I was uh, speaking of uh, an expert dialogue when Helga was talking about budget, I think now it will become even more of an expert dialogue with you on state aid issues. You are our super expert on uh, state aid. And I have a first question for you. Is a call for participation enough to solve the state aid and de minimis issue in a project proposal? So speaking about this case and this specific question, we are talking about the indirect aid to be granted to third parties outside the project part, uh, project partnership, so not project partners. We have to say when someone is given this kind of contractual obligation to grant indirect state aid, they have to comply with it. So in sense of having a call for participation for third parties would not be sufficient, so to say, to eliminate aid. But we have a huge simplification in these terms we don't deal with the minimis to third parties. We will be applying GBER regulation, which was amended this year. And the only thing that we need to, uh, that we need to focus on, that we have to measure or we have to um, stress is the limit of 20,000 euros per undertaking per project. Meaning whenever you have indirect state aid, if you have a call for participation, participants, you decide who's participating in this, uh, this activity, which is affected with indirect aid, but no de minimis, no uh, collection of de minimis declarations. We are using different regulation to comply with the state aid. Partners come to us, they say, what is the amount of aid? What is the amount of this service to be provided? And uh, the state aid can be granted to, to third parties. I hope that this is uh, something that the project partners um, will appreciate and that uh, with this, uh, they will not call it a problem of state aid, but that it would be easy to comply with uh, what has been given in the subsidy contract as obligation on state aid. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Maybe you mentioned GBER, um, since not everyone is an expert out there. If I'm not fully mistaken and just to see whether I also understand something, at least general block exemption of uh, the rules, right? I mean, there's a regulation on that. This is what you were referring to. Exactly. So there's this an interesting uh, tutorial also recorded uh, by Christina on state aid for those that are really new to that topic. Strong recommendation to uh, watch the presentation uh, recorded by Christina, which is also available on our website. We have another question, maybe by someone who has watched the tutorial already and definitely maybe read the. Um, ah, but this is already, this is not, I ah, know, this is state aid. Sorry. Will the Italian contribution from the Fondo di Rotazione to national public institutions be considered an additional public co financing? And if so, does it have to be underlined in the application? Yes. Um, just to say that this question is also relevant for all other partners or, or partners coming also from other member states in sense when we are talking about the additional public co-financing. So yes, this is important. It needs to be underlined in the application form. There is a, a section co-financing origin of partner contribution where partners need to state what is the origin of their contribution. And in case of state aid relevance of these partners, there might be limitations. But regardless whether it's Fondo di Rotazione or any other 
a public fund in any other country from which the partners will receive additional public co-financing to their budgets. Yes, please, this is relevant information and provided in the application form. Thank you, Christina. And we become even more specific. I think, the, the, as you said, the co-financing is a really general uh, issue. It's not only Italian. I think that's really important to understand. Um, now we move into SO 1.1 and state aid issues. Lists, SO 1.1 lists several actions targeting businesses, like implementing pilots to support SMEs and taking up innovation, innovative technologies, fostering technology, innovation transfer from research to businesses, etc. Which of these can be considered as non-state aid? Okay, so speaking about any action, any activity included in the project, in order for it to be state aid relevant, it's not only sufficient that it's economic activity, but it also has to bring selective advantage, in this case, to business. So this is something that is determined when the each project proposal is assessed for the stated relevance. In this case, there is also part of the application form in which we ask project applicants to assess what could be the advantage given to a business in certain project activity. It, it can be said that this specific um, SO 1.1 could introduce higher risk, could be more stated relevant, but it's not a must. So in this sense, there is no list of activities which are stated relevant or not. We assess how each activity is implemented, in which condition, who is benefiting, who is receiving advantage, and whether this is selective advantage or not, to see whether there is state aid relevance or not. Thank you very much, Christina. It's quite late already. Uh, there's many more questions for you. However, to all, out of, uh, to all you out there, I would really recommend to book a slot with Christina in the individual consultations, maybe if you have very specific questions or address your question to the help desk. Um, Christina will have a look at these uh, questions and try to answer them then in uh, written form. So for the time being, thank you very much, Christina. And I would like to bring back mm -hmm. Helga briefly for maybe one or two last budget-related questions before I think we really need to close. It's uh, at least here in Austria, 12 o'clock is uh, the holy time for lunch. Um, maybe not where you are coming from. In Malta, maybe you would be fine to carry on until two o'clock before lunch actually. Maybe one o'clock, maybe one o'clock. <laughs> so, but let's, let's uh, try to finish soon. Um, I have one to two, maybe three questions very briefly for you, so. A very straightforward one. Uh, can associated partners be subcontracted? Straightforward, but needs a bit of an explanation here. Uh, associated partners are not financing partners. Therefore, yes, they can be subcontracted. However, it has always to be kept in mind that procurement rules need to be followed. So this is very important and important also to keep in mind the principles of procurement, that uh, it is done in a transparent way and also that, you know, some uh, these, these partners might have a bit of an advantage over, um, over others out there who would not know anything about the project that you are implementing. Okay, while I'm waiting for the next question for you, maybe... Um... I was, um, no, I will, I will park this to the end. Let's uh, go into this one now. Are private lead applicants still obliged to provide a financial guarantee? This is a novelty. This is actually the financial guarantee was always needed for uh, those uh, lead, uh, private lead partners uh, after, during contracting. And this is a novelty. No, it is no longer needed. The guarantee, we have done away with this guarantee. It's only the financial capacity check that will be done uh, once the um, application form is submitted and the documents More. that are related for this. So we have uh, two more questions for you, Helga. Mm -hmm. We were just thinking of uh, whether we want to uh, extend maybe a bit further, but I'm... I'm you know, the interest will never fade away, especially on the topic of budget, I'm afraid. Um, 
so let's have a look into the next one. The ratio subsidies to ERDF requested by the lead applicant is higher than 0.5. Does the lead applicant's ERDF budget in that case mean only the part which remains at the lead applicant after distribution of the funding amongst the partners or is it about the total budget of the project? Okay, this is related specifically to private lead applicants that have to provide the simplified financial statement, and it is uh, about a particular field where you have to include the ERDF allocated only to the lead partner, that is not the ERDF, the total ERDF of the project, not the total ERDF of the project, but only the amount of the lead partner. Okay, we have one more. Are there going to be any changes regarding the financing and payment methods compared to earlier years? That's a pretty broad one, Helga. It is pretty broad, uh, but maybe just to say that it is, in a way, it is similar to the 1420 programming period, where the program follows the principle of reimbursement of costs incurred and paid by the beneficiaries. This means that there will not be any pre-financing coming from, from the program. So this is the same as it was previously, uh, and it means that the beneficiary must uh, fully pre-finance um, its project expenditure. However, there is a novelty. So it's not a complete no and that's it. Uh, where the activity and the finance reporting towards the managing authority and the joint secretariat has been disentangled. This with the hope that uh, it will lead to a faster reimbursement of funds. So this is the novelty, yes, with regards to financing. Okay. Then I would suggest, Helga, this is the last one. What do you think? Actually, then I have one more. I could go on. This might not be for you. Uh, after project closure, is it possible to generate income with the tools created or produced or generated in the project? This is something that we do not monitor. I mean, in the, in the regulations, the, the new regulations, revenues are not... Um, uh, included anymore so it is something that we do we will not monitor and it is to be kept from outside the project oh, okay thank you then Helga, time is never enough but it seems also that the world is not enough to some of our applicants at least the world of central europe the program area maybe you can answer this otherwise i will bring back in luca there seem to be many questions i hear from my colleagues uh, in the background um, on whether uh, we can also finance partners from outside the Central Europe area. So if you can oh, answer it straight away, I think that would be easiest sure, and I don't have sure. to bring back Luca. Sure. It is possible to have project partners from EU countries coming from outside the Central Europe area. As I mentioned earlier, there is no longer this limitation of the 20%. However, in order to have these partners um, included in the project, they need to be beneficial for the Central Europe area. I think this is something that already Luca mentioned also in the beginning when answering uh, about the partner coming from Rome and so on. But this is related to EU partners, okay? So third parties, third party countries will not be financed through the program. So the ones receiving ERDF are the EU, um, are for coming partners coming from EU countries. And maybe important to, to say that this includes uh, UK. Yes, I mean, we've all heard about Brexit as well, so. <laughs> Unfortunately. So thank you, Helga, for this answer, which, which I would like to close for today. I think time is up. Thank you all for your questions. And thank you very much to all my colleagues for sharing their knowledge and expertise. Thank you also to all other members of the JS team who were supporting this event invisibly in the background. In the coming days and weeks, we will keep on supporting you with the development of your applications. We will soon upload the recording of this event and invite you to more live Q&A webinars, which we are planning for 
January and February. So if you believe if we could do something better next time, please say so in the feedback form that we will send to you after this event. But before we close for today, I would like to pass on some important messages for all of you that are now developing proposals. The first one is very straightforward. Make use of the various support measures offered by the program and which we mentioned so often today also, including the tutorials on project development. If you're quite advanced already, you heard this, um, we have started to offer individual consultations. So if your project idea is already in quite an advanced stage, you can also request on this platform here, your individual consultation for your project idea, but only one as I say. They can be booked by until Monday 11th uh, of February, by the way. Then secondly, I would really like to recommend to be active in this applicant community, get in touch with each other, book meetings and post your ideas to find the best partners and to build your transnational partnerships. Last but not least, if you have more questions for us, or if your question could not be answered in this webinar, please do not hesitate to contact also our national contact points or get back to our help desk at helpdesk at interact-central.eu. With this, thank you very much once more for attending and all the best wishes for your pro proposal development from Vienna. Have a good day. Bye-bye.